2 Samuel chapter 23, 8 to 12, this particular passage is talking about some of David's mighty men. And it says in verse 8 of 2 Samuel 23, it says, These are the names of David's warriors. And some of these names are really hard to pronounce, but so this, uh, we'll just do our best. Yosheb, whoever he is, was chief of the officers. And it says here that he wielded his spear against 800 men and he killed them at one time. Now, I don't mean one swoosh and 800 died, but what I meant was he did battle with 800, okay, which is quite a few. And verse 9 says, And after him was another man, Eleazar, okay. And he said that he was among the three warriors with David when they defied the Philistines and the men of Israel retreated in the place that they had gathered to battle. Verse 10, but Elias stood his ground. He attacked the Philistines until his hand was tied and stuck to his sword. Have you ever been in that place where your muscles so tight from moving it that you just like you can't release it? Have you ever had that situation? No, yes, I, I have. Sometimes working with dumbbells. I don't, I'm talking about... Dumbbells, not people. Okay, so I'm talking about dumbbell. I wouldn't be that rude. Okay, but dumbbells, you know, you're doing repeated curls and then all of a sudden you burn it out and it's like you can't do anymore and you're pumping it out, you're pumping it out and all of a sudden you finish and like you can't let go. I've had it. Can't let go. You want that experience? Go to gym. Okay, and uh, you can't let go and your hands go, ah, and when you let it go, it's like, ah, this sharp pain comes. So when I read that, I go like, yeah, I can understand that. Okay. And it says, the only time the Israelite troops came back was to plunder the dead. The victory's already won. But here's the guy. He says, and after him was Shema. Okay. He says, here's the Herodite. Now, the Herodite, or should be pronounced Herodite, okay. The only thing we have there is that he came from an area where it's called the Well of Herod, okay. And uh, he was a Herodite, meaning the region he came from. And it says, and the Philistines had assembled in formation. And there was a field full of lentils. Hmm. That was Jacob's favorite food, wasn't it? Jacob. Esau gave up his birthright for a bowl of lentils. Vegetarian. Hmm? And the Bible says that there is a field full of lentils and the troops fled from the Philistines. But Shema took his stand in the middle of the field and he defended it and he struck down the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. So I know that uh, a couple of weeks back, back on Father's Day, uh, John Lewis spoke on this particular man. And I thought, well, that's good because I'm going to do that in a couple of weeks too. It's already pre-done. Some things might be similar, but some things might be a little bit different because it's great having different teachers who take different angles in the area. But I love the idea how the prophet Samuel, who lived in the time of King David and King Saul, described the unique individuals who came to David's side and created a fierce alliance with him. You know, what one can do is great. What two can do is mighty. What three can do is even greater. And Samuel goes into more detail about three particular individuals. With each one, he tells a story that serves as a resume for the leadership. Now, we, we, we realize that here, the prophet Samuel didn't really write this because he's already dead. Hmm. But someone's written it in the name of Samuel. Hmm. But I like this very meaning of the word here, Shema, because it means astonishment. Have you ever been left astonished? Hmm? Aston I like the Greek word serendip. Or some say serendipity, but serendip. You know why? Because the word serendip means surprised. But the Hebrew word Shema means astonishment. And the book of Samuel describes one brief moment when the Philistines banded together at a place where there was a field full of lentils, beans. And Israel's troops fled from them in fear. But Shema, astonishment, and I imagine that his actions are astonishing, stands in the middle of the field and he defended it and struck the Philistines down. And we're told that he didn't just strike them down, but that the Lord brought about a great victory. Now I try to picture what this must be like. I'm figuring it's a village or it's a living area and I, I'm gathering that, that, that this field of lentils, okay, is what they specialize in growing. And it's food, it's food for the people. It's food that would be harvested and stored. Now, we know through other stories in the Bible that the Philistines felt complete freedom in the time of Saul 
to come at harvest time. They would come at harvest time. In fact, the Bible says earlier with Saul and Jonathan that when it came to harvest time, they would come and before it could be taken, they would take what they wanted. They had taken the weapons away from the children of Israel. In fact, it said that the men of Israel at that point, just for their farming tools, had to go to the blacksmiths that were either Philistines or okay by the Philistines to sharpen their tools to be able to harvest the fields. And this is what the enemy would do. The harvest would wait, I mean, the enemy would wait until the harvest was ready. The enemy didn't come when it's time to turn the soil. The enemy didn't come when it's time time to plant the seed. The enemy didn't come when it's growing up. But when it's about ready to be harvested, when the time is right, or perhaps when they had harvested it, the enemy would come in and they would take and they'd steal. That's how often I see the enemy working in the lives of men and women of God. The enemy so often doesn't wait when you're at your lowest. He doesn't wait until you're just going. But often the enemy comes when you're at the peak or the epiphany of your ministry or your call. He waits until where you feel you're at your peak. He waits until you feel that you're really moving and advancing. And right when he feels that he can cause the most damage for you and the others around you, he comes. He comes. Because he wants to rob from you the blessing of what you have sown. He wants to rob from you and the others the blessing what is about to be harvested. It's like you're about to harvest the blessing of all you've done, the blessing of your labour, the blessing of your sowing of seed, the blessing of being faithful, and he waits for it. Bang! The enemy comes in. It might be completely broadsided, like you don't know how or where it's come from, or it might be something you've kept hidden that he's allowed to grow and grow and keep it hidden until he feels to expose it at the time where it causes the most damage. Is that not true? Is that not a ploy of the enemy? Isn't that how sometimes we read about great preachers and about how they're doing so well, and it seems to be at the peak of their ministry or the peak of what they're happening. I read about great preachers, and, and I, I've known several of these great preachers uh, across the world in our nation, where it seems like they're at the peak of their ministry, at the peak of their end, and all of a sudden, it's like the curtain was pulled back, and wow, we find these things, and that very thing that was built up just seems to be corrupted or attacked or falls backwards. Is that not true? This is exactly what the Philistines did. When they raided, they wanted wealth. And wealth doesn't necessarily mean that they had any more gold or silver left, but they wanted the fruits of the land. They wanted the fruits of the land. Now, there's something about God's hand on that nation of Israel. You know, whew, back in about after World War I, around about 1917, 1920, 1925, a Jewish people from all over Europe started coming back towards uh, Israel. It wasn't called Israel, but towards Palestine. Now, all it was in that time in history was desert, just desert. It was barren and arid. And the Arabs who had taken possession of it, really, they had nothing to show. There was nothing there. It was arid and done. In fact, history tells us that even when they came back, the original Palestinians there who originally come back from Egypt, okay, weren't offended. They're like, well, see what you can do with the dirt. See what you can do. We can't do anything. See what you can do. Now, the majority of the Jews who came back went to America. In just a matter of one, two years, there's over two million Jews who went to the United States. And that was because of the persecution in Europe. Prior to World War I, Europe had the biggest population of Jews in the world. But because all of the nations, just about all of the nations in Europe, all of a sudden rose up against Jews. This is before Adolf Hitler rose up against Jews and began to expel them or make it hard for them. They began to scatter. A majority, of course, went to America because the doors were opened. But then another group of people went into the Palestinian land hoping to reclaim it. Today, Israel is the biggest population of Jews and the United States is the second biggest population of Jews. But if you do your homework prior to World War I, you'll find out there were millions and millions who lived across the Europe continent. Back to the point. If you went to Israel today, and after it was formally brought back as a nation in 48, and they took the name Israel, 
And if you see through agriculture, and if you could see today how they have brought what was desert into flourishing fields and forests and reclaimed. In fact, the Middle East is in shock and awe and disbelief, so much so they said, we want it back. We want it back. What they couldn't turn and couldn't do, they did. But I don't believe they themselves did it, but I believe it was God. When I've been to Israel a couple of times at Sandra, I'm not so much into the sight stuff. I'm the worst person to be with. But I, I like being in the hub of Jerusalem. And uh, they have a, like a marketplace, isn't that right? And the whole idea is not the fridges they have are only little fridges because every day you go to market, get the meat you need for that day, you get the food. Not like buy bulk. It was like just what you need, just what you need. And Sandra and I would love it because I've never seen almonds as big as you find in Jerusalem. They're the biggest almonds. Hmm? I mean, the fruit, I mean, I think I got intoxicated on the fruit because they had fruit that I love, okay? And uh, what's that crunchy one we like? Uh, persimmons. We love persimmons. And I was buying kilos and kilos of persimmons. I was eating probably eight persimmons a day while I was there, okay? And I'd just go out, get fresh, come back, go out. They're so good that they'd give me a baker's dozen. You know what I mean? They'd give me 13 instead of 12, okay? And uh, it, it, was, it was so good. And I said, my goodness, you would never know that a nation that was just arid desert could be so prosperous. And what I'm trying to tell you is going back in time, God's hand was there. And the enemy knew it, and the Philistines knew it, and the Philistines knew that at harvest time, it was the time to attack. At harvest time, it was the time to rise up. And I could imagine on the fields, and I can imagine that they would have seen the Philistine army coming towards this village or this township. We know Bethlehem was known because of it, what? It's grain and it's flour, the bread. But we know that here where Shemar is, okay, it has to do with lentils. And the enemy is coming in. They've lined up. They're all in line. And, and the Bible says they're in position. They're lined up. And it says that the men of that town saw it. But the men of that town decided, we're going to flee. We're not going to stand our ground. But I love so much Shemar here because, you know, running in fear is not a solution to your problem. See, we, we live in a society today where we tend to run. When we're faced with confrontation, we run. When we're faced with a problem, we run. When we're faced with something that's difficult, we run. When we're faced with something that's awkward, we run. We, we, we're, we're like a dog with the towel between our legs. Okay, we run. But there's this one person that says, I'm tired of running. Because running makes us weaker and it makes our opposition stronger. Running makes us weaker and it makes the opposition stronger. And you want to know something? If you want to get stronger in your faith, you want to get stronger in your Lord, stop running from opposition. Stop running from challenges. Stop running from the things that confront you and say, I'm going to have to take a stand. Well, what if I fail, Pastor? Then take a stand and say, no more. It's not going to be something that holds me captive. No more. I'm going to take a stand. And this is who Shemar is to me. He's the one person that stands between two armies. What do you mean two armies? Was it two? Well, yeah, there is the enemy, the Philistines, but there's also his own army, the Israelites, who are running away. He was one man that stood between two armies. One army that said, we'll run, and the other army says, we'll take. And he stood between them. Now, I don't know exactly what was in his head. I don't know exactly what he was thinking. But I could imagine if there's anybody around him, they would have said, don't be silly. You're going to die. You know, sometimes we got to realize that there's some things more important and more threatening than death itself. There's something more threatening and more intimidating than death itself. Now, I'm a bit weird if you don't know that already, okay? But I am weird if a capital W, okay? And I say this, if you know me closely, you would have heard me say this. I say, God, when I die, I want to die well. 
when I die, my wife's smiling and nodding her head. And I say, God, when I die, I want to die well. I want to die good. Someone said to me, what does that mean, die good? I said, I want to die with purpose. I want to die well. I want to die well. I want my life to sum up with meaning. I want my life to have purpose. I want it to speak kingdom for the very moment I die. With the very last breath that comes out of this body and goes back to decay, to its original corruptible thing, I want it to speak kingdom. That what I've held to, what I believe, has meaning. And that's why when I read about Shema and how he would stand in the field of beans, lentils, when others would run off, there was meaning. It was like him saying, you're not going to take our food. You're not just going to walk in here and take our food. I know Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, that man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that perceives the mouth of God. But Moses said it first in Deuteronomy chapter 8 with the manna. And he said in Deuteronomy 8, I think it's what, about verse 3, he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus reiterated and brought the meaning of the word alive when he faced the enemy. That there's more to life than the natural things that surround us. There's more to life than the bread and butter of life that surround us. There's the spiritual well-being, and this is what God's all about. This is it. Friends, if you died today, how would you go? If you were told you had a month or two months, like what Janet had, right, Peter? Just a few, how many months since she was diagnosed before she died? Six months? About six months. If you knew you had six months to go, I mean, there's a trauma of it, of course. But if you knew you had six months to go, what would you say? There's so much more I wish I could do, Lord. You know, I really wanted to do more things in you. I really wanted to share more for you. I really want to do more for you. You know, there's a cost for serving God. Do you know that? There's a price. Now, I'm not talking about a price where others go, oh, woe is you, oh, you're a champion. There's a price where you've got to die to self. There's a price. It's like that king of Israel saying, you don't just beat it what's required or what's expected, but you continue to hit that arrow and hit that arrow until it basically disintegrates in your hand until there's nothing left. You do it as a declaration, I'm going to do it. You, you be like an Elisha that follows after Elijah. And when all the other prophets turn around and go back, you say, no, I'll follow you. No, I'll follow you. And the other prophets say, come back, come back. You go, no, I'll follow him. I'll follow him. I'll follow him. I'm going to go through. This is what it's all about. But Shema finds himself alone in the field of beans with an enemy coming straight towards him. Now, I, I could imagine that the enemy, first of all, thought, tremendous, they're all running away, and so they should. And then I can imagine in my own imagination that maybe the commander said, is that one guy standing there by himself? Is he serious? Is he ridiculous? Maybe they banged their shields a little bit louder. Maybe they grunted and snorted and threw stones or made a bit of dust to make it known. But all of a sudden there's one guy. You know what? You better learn to enjoy your own company because you're going to have to spend some time with yourself. It's great having friends and it's great having others, but at some point you've got to be an eagle. It's great being in a coop. Not really, it stinks, okay? <laughs> but it's great being surrounded. How you doing? <laughs> Good. <laughs> but at some point, you've got to be an eagle. Eagle says, give me some space. Give me some space. At some point, there's a rising up. Now, I don't know exactly what the Philistines did, so I can't tell you what I really, really know. But maybe they sent out one guy, like a Hollywood movie, you know what I mean? Maybe they said, Harry, go out there and deal with this fella. Boom! Side of the head, he's down. Ronnie, you and Jack get out there. Boom, boom! Double whack, they're down. Let's get our champion out. It's all over. 
so they come in force. I'm amazed there hasn't been a movie made for the sake of a bean. I don't know. But all I know is that to their shock and dismay, this one Israelite, this one man strikes him down. You might say, well, they knew about his reputation. No, this was how he got the reputation. This is how he got the reputation. Because when it talks about David's mighty man, they talk about what he did in the past. So up to this point, we don't know what he did other than he lived in the area where there is a well. And the thing that he cherished and the thing that he valued was challenged. Now your battle may not be everybody else's battle. Is that true? Because that few of the lentils wasn't the rest of his town's battle. They took off. So you've got to learn to not be distracted because the others aren't all rallying around you when you think they should. Don't you see my need? Don't you see my hurt? Don't you see my pain? Why aren't there more of you around me? Now I have a wife who's a prayer warrior and I thank God for the prayer chain and the intercessors. And don't be fooled, I'll call on them to pray for certain areas and things. But I'm going to tell you something. If I can't get them or get her, I have an intercessor that puts all other intercessors to shame. Amen. And you want to know the good news? So do you. Because my Bible says that when Jesus died and rose again, he didn't come back and live in your heart. <laughs> Jesus is not living in your heart. He is seated at the right hand of Father making intercession. Well, who's in my heart? The Spirit of God. He says, the Spirit will come in my name and he'll teach you all things. The Spirit comes in the name of Jesus, but it's the Spirit. That's why you're born of the Spirit. And as I said in Romans, it says, and when his Holy Spirit connects with your spirit, something happens, there's an epiphany, and something happens, and it cries out, Abba, Daddy, Papa, God. What's that? Heaven on earth. When's the last time you tasted heaven on earth? Huh? It was 3 a.m. this morning when I tasted heaven on earth. This morning at 3 a.m., I just felt the need to pray and intercede. I don't know how many people I prayed for, but it was a lot. And after Friday night, it was you too, Colin, okay? But I mean, the fact is that I was praying for a lot, okay? Just messing with them. I was praying. I was praying a storm it affected the dog. It affected my wife. Carol's in the other room in the deep sleep, okay? So I don't know what happened there. But the fact of the matter is, it was having an effect. I said, God, if it can have an effect on the immediate things around me, then what's it doing in the spiritual realm? And it wasn't because of flesh or anything else. I just felt the presence of God, and the presence of God is heaven on earth, and heaven on earth is when his spirit connects with my spirit, and God says, I'm here. Shema. And they're in shock. They're in disbelief. Who could know the mind of one man? Who could know the mind of one woman? Who could know the, the mind of, of one senior? Who could know the mind of, of one youth or one child or one young adult? How can we call their action anything but madness sometimes? How could a person have such little value for their own life that they would choose a battle that in natural circumstances they cannot win? Nobody would have scorned them for running because everybody else did. And that's why when one person stands up in faith, when one person stands on the promise of God, they stand out. The first thing is others want to pull them back down to their level. And then if they can't, they just leave them alone. And as long as you learn to realize that your own company can be good company, you're going to be okay. Because people like Shema create a problem for the rest of us. And we need people to create a problem for the rest of us. Because when we don't stand up, we're living a life less value than it should be. We live for things instead of living for the king. I'm telling you something. It's hard to tell the story as you sit around the fireplace and explain that you had no option but to run. 
When what your child wants to hear is that you said, but I stood. It's like when Winston Churchill during World War II had to battle with the German army and the Luftwaffe, the Air Force that would bomb uh, um, London and England. And how in Northumberland there was a big coal strike because they wanted more. And it was huge, and, and they needed the coal of Northumberland. So Winston Churchill went to Northumberland, and the protest was hundreds, if not thousands. And he had like a little temporary stage where a box set up, no higher than this, so he could walk up to it. And, and he was wearing his big overcoat. It was cold, and he was wearing his, his hat that he'd wear, that unique hat. And uh, really, he had a big stogie, a, a big cigar, if you could imagine Churchill. I can he kind of had his arm folded like this as he would. And he had this big cigar as he did. And as he stood there, the striking coal miners just began to yell and yell and yell and yell and yell. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour. And he just stood there. And as he stood there, he just drew on his cigar and let them yell. Because he knew finally in that cold air their voices would get hoarse. And they did. It was no good competing against the yelling. It was no good competing against the screaming. He just waited. And he abided his time. He had this way of sort of arching himself and just standing there. And when they finished, or the voice went down, he took a big draw from his cigar. He leaned in the microphone and he spoke just a few words. He said, after this war, and after we have defeated this evil man from Germany who wanted to take our land, our families, our wealth, our freedom, after this war, he said, you'll be sitting around your dinner tables as grandparents. And your grandchildren will be around there and they'll say, Granddad, Poppy, Pops. We heard about this evil man called Adolf Hitler. And the crowd is listening to him. And he said, and they'll say to you, Granddad, what did you do during that great war? He just had this ability to stop, pregnant pause as we call it. He stopped, took another big draw, blew out the smoke. The crowd is riveted now. No one's moving, no one's speaking. And he leans forward again and he says, they might say, Granddad, were you one of those heroes in the air that repelled the Luftwaffe? And you'll say, no, as he did. Took another draw. Granddad, were you one of those brave Navy men that defended our shores and our trade against the U-boats and against Hitler's warships? And he leans forward and he says, and you'll say, no, Takes never draw. Granddad, were you one of those heroic men that fought in the fields, hand to hand, defending our beaches, defending the lands of our allies? Granddad, were you one of those men? He leans forward and he goes, No. And he says, I will say, but granddad, what did you do when this evil came to our shores? Took another big draw again. I'm not endorsing cigarettes, by the way. Took another big draw. (laughs) And lean forward, he says, grandson, granddaughter, I went on strike. And he walked off the stage. 
It's a true story. Could have heard a pin drop. Then all of a sudden there's a shuffling. Turned around, put on the hats, picked up the tools, went back to the mines. Now, I in no way visualize God to look anything like Churchill. <laughs> Praise the Lord for that. Huh? But I kind of do, I kind of do, I kind of do think that God might ask us, so in the battle for your family, in the battle for your marriage, in the battle for your fellow man, in the battle for God's kingdom to advance, what did you do? Sam, would you mind coming up to the team to play for me? Did you do intercession and prayer? Did you give of your own resources to sow seed to advance the kingdom? Did you go and witness and evangelize and share the good news? What did you do? What did you do? Well, Lord... I needed a home that was better than one I had. I needed a car because my other one wasn't up to date. I needed a bigger holiday. I needed the biggest something else. I needed this. Now, is there anything wrong with you having those things? No, 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 no. God doesn't say you've got to have a car that's dying or a car that's brand new. He couldn't care less because things don't have morals. They are amoral, Right? What happens is when we love things more than him. When we love things. People say to me, well, I can't come to church or come too often because, you know, the kids need me. You know what the kids need? God, God's presence. See, you might be strong enough from the Lord to where you don't need to be regular. But your children won't make it. Because they never had the grounding you did. I love how, and I'm, it's not just Joe and Jess, not just them, but I'm saying I love how Joe and Jess, and I haven't talked to him about this, I love how Joe and Jess has said that our baby has to come into our life, not us changing to fit to our baby's life. That's how it used to be. When we had prayer meetings, you you remember those days? And you were in America, right? We'd have prayer meetings. Four kids, yeah. And they would be in their jammies because they got showered and fed. They'd come in with their blankets or their sooky blanket or their little pillows. Put it out on the floor. And they'd be there in the prayer time. That's how it was. Now, I didn't grow up like that because I was too big, but that's what we did with our boy. Born in the house of God, got him done, we did it. Things have changed. Yeah, that's right, things have changed. So let's see 20 years. Because what I sow today will reap a harvest tomorrow. What I sow today will reap a harvest tomorrow. My number one theme in my life is discipleship. You know who my number one disciple was? My own son. My own son. Number one disciple. Now he's responsible for his disciple. My number one disciple is my son. I remember the sports. Dad, I want to play soccer. I'm with you, son. I'm with you. We're going to play the Christian league. but They're not as good as the other league. I said, the good is not the league. The good is what God does in you. Seven years we played that soccer league. Christian. Well, I didn't. (laughs) From 10 to 17. 
and he reached every epiphany of that league. And he always said to me, but dad, it's not FIFA. That's what it was. It's not FIFA. I said, son, I don't care. It's who you are. And he'd finished his season and he'd reached the epiphany of it all. He had, uh, uh, his club it was uh, in the area had won their, their championship and their group, what do you call it? Uh, he had played the district. His district had won that. Uh, he was picked for the state. He'd come into that area. He'd, they'd drawn with Western Australia, I think it was, uh, in that area. So it wasn't beaten, okay, but drawn. And then he was picked in the um, Australian team, okay, uh, for the under 17s, or it was there. It was an honorary thing, but picked in that team. And he reached the epiphany of everything in his area. And instead of him being on like a, wow, he was like, ugh, because he knew it was over. I go, what's wrong? He goes, if only I had played FIFA. And I said, God is bigger than FIFA. So we went to America. And one particular church, there's an Englishman at this church, an older man. And uh, he had played soccer, professional soccer. And I don't know how it happened. The pastor of the church had told him. And he went home and brought back one of his jerseys for Josiah. And he said, I don't remember the word exactly because it was between Josiah and him, but it was something like, you know, God's got his hand on you. He'll take every, it was something unusual. Let's just encourage him. You know what I mean? He's encouraged. And when we got home, I remember we were going through all the voice. In those days, you had voice messages on your phone, right? You know, home phone. Okay, today it's mobile. Home phone. And there was a message and it was like a, 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 a scout sort of person, not boy scouts, but you know, for soccer. Okay, or football, what they call it. Okay, and uh, he said, we want you to try out for one of the Queensland state um, clubs because they're the feeder clubs for the national one. Hmm? And, uh, and he was like, what do I do? And I said, well, you know, you want to try out, try out. So I think it was eight or 12 weeks. I, I can't remember exactly. It could be eight, could be 12. He had to go each time and try out to see how he went. Now, if I am correct, I could be wrong. He was the only one that came from the Christian league. Everybody else came from clubs that were known, okay? But he went in there and he, 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 he competed, he tried we said it's in the heart. He's 18 years of age now. It's in the heart. It's God's anointing. And at the end of it, after the 80, it came down to two lists. One list was those who have been pre-selected and they had a week off to come back to sign a contract. And the contract, not, not paid the full money, but the contract was that they agreed for that term and they'd have to fly every second week or so like to Townsville or Cairns or, or wherever it had to be. You know what I mean? And he had to sign this contract. And then from there was a chance when you get caught, if you're good enough, caught onto the National League. Does that sort of make sense? And uh, the other group we picked were those that were probably going to make it, but they still had to do another week of training. So the ones that were straight in had the week off. And the ones that did more training would still be there. Everybody else is cut loose. Here is on the first list. He said to me, Dad, I, I've got the week off. I said, you have. He says, what's your advice? I said, I've got none. He says, Dad, you've always advised me. I said, not on this, mate. Not on this. He goes, why not? I said, you're 18. You've got to make your own bed now. Because the decision you make is your decision. Well, Dad, you know, I won't be at church every week. And I said, I understand that. He says, are you going to say something to me about it? I said, no, man, you're your own man. It's between you and God. He says, well, you know, Christians can do this, you know. And I said, of course they can. I said, there are Christian athletes everywhere and I thank God for them. Of course you can. That's why it's not my place to say. He said, what does that mean? I said, mate, I sold my life. It's gone. I only know one thing, but that's my life. It's not yours. I don't have a right to tell you how to live your life. You're a man now, you're 18. You can go to war, you can drive a car, you can legally kill a man, 
by going to war in the army. So who am I to tell you now at 18 what to do? My job was as you're getting to that place. Well, you know, he was probably more rattled than blessed. So I said, what are you going to do next week? He says, well, there's a youth camp on. I'm going to the youth camp. I kind of went, yeah, okay. So we drove him up there and said, see you. And went back home. We drove up to the Sunshine Coast because we'd already started. We dropped him off and came back. When he got back to the camp, we picked him up from here. And it was in the night out, I think like Friday night, late at the night. And he came to our room and he says, uh, Dad, why is it when they want to talk, it's always like really late at night? You know what I'm trying to say? When I want to talk, they don't want to talk. But when they want to talk, it's really late at night. You know what I mean? But you know, you love them so much, you just say, no worries, mate, just talk. You know what I mean? Just don't tell them no. Don't send them away, guys. Just say, go ahead. You know what I mean? Don't, don't, don't blow it. Just, just take it when you can get it because it won't be there for long, okay? I said, what is it, mate? Santa lying in bed. Dad, I'm emotional. And I said, did something happen at camp? Yes. Did something go bad? Well, kind of, no, but yes, but is. I go, I'm confused, okay? He said, well, you know, I'm excited about this opportunity. I said, great, then do it. He says, but I feel another voice. I said, then listen to it. He says, what do you think? I said, I told you, I can't do it. He says, why not, Dad? I said, because if I tell you to do something, five years' time you get regret, you're going to blame me. And you're going to say, Dad stopped me, or Dad took it, or Dad robbed me. And I said, I love you too much to do that. I said, I can tell you this, whatever you choose, your mother and I will love you and support you. And I said, it won't change. But you make your own decision. Well, obviously the answer is in itself, right? That wasn't his first one. There's another one to go and another one perhaps after that. But all I'm trying to tell you guys is this. You might think that what I'm talking about is insignificant. You might say, you know, Pastor, we love you, but we're like ships in the night. I don't agree or endorse the things you are. You're a little bit religious. I understand. I don't agree I'm religious. I have a relationship, but I understand what you're saying. I understand. But let me tell you something. That was my field of lentils. That was my field of beans. And I saw an enemy coming. And that enemy said, I want your son. And I said, that's worth dying for. That's worth dying for. I'm willing to die for that. I'm willing to step out in the field called sport and I'm ready to plant my feet in that dirt and say come on then bring it on and there's other voices that says no 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 I said come on bring it on what's the worst thing you can do take my life then it had purpose Come on, bring it. That was one of my lentil fields. I've had many. But that's what I'm trying to explain to you, that we will have these fields of lentils where you will value it and others will not see any value in it. And it wasn't for me to judge others who did differently. It's not my place. It isn't for me to say they must be like I am. No, I have my own convictions. And for me to go against my convictions, it would be sin. But for me to force my convictions on you would also be sin. Because I'm not the Holy Spirit. And I'm not Jesus. And I'm not the Messiah. I'm just a man who likes to defend his bean patch. And until you've been there, oh, I couldn't help it. Man. Until you've been there, you can't judge me. Can we bow our heads? Father, speak to our hearts. This is not a message of condemnation. It's not a message of judgment. But I tell you what, it is a message to try and stir you up. And I make no apology for that. 
You can leave here and say that message is a whole lot of rubbish. That's okay. It's my bean patch, not yours. But I put my feet in the dirt and I'm holding on. Father, reveal your Holy Spirit to each and every one of us. <laughs> Bring out the spirit of truth and liberty and freedom. Lord, we all have our own bean patch. We have things that we think is worth standing for and other things that we're prepared to run away from. But I'm asking you, Lord, to raise up men and women who have the fire in the belly, the umption of the Holy Spirit. We might not always understand things, not to judge others, not to force others into where we stand, but be prepared to stand even if it is alone. Because in the end, Lord, we give account to you. So Father, I speak grace and mercy.